This is my first demo. So um, I'm going to tell you the way I do things, and they work for me. Um, you know, if we have in our mind that it's a learning process, uh, if anybody sees something that I do and they have a better way of doing it, well, put up your hand and we'll share it. Um, like I said, it works okay for me, but maybe somebody has a better idea, it'll, it'll, it'll end up even better. Like I said, it's my first demo, so I'm going to apologize for any shortcomings right off the bat. I learned many years ago, if you're going to stand up in front of a crowd, to make them more at ease and to make myself more at ease, you start off with a joke or two. Um, so let's do that. Who's got a joke? <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I keep thinking, you know, a couple of years ago at Halloween, it was raining like a son of a gun. And a little kid comes up and he knocks on the door. And he was dressed up as a pirate. You know, with a patch in front of his eyes and a pirate hat and whatnot. And he was alone. So I said, what are you dressed up as? And out comes his chest and he says, I'm dressed up as a pirate. And I said, oh, where are your buccaneers? He had this big floppy hat on. He said, under my bucket hat. <laughs> oh. Can we have the, the slides, please? Um, what I've done is I've put this presentation together, and uh, you, you people have a, an excellent way of doing things. You have USB keys that you download things to. If you download the, um, the PDF, portion. Um, you should have everything on that to be able to turn these salt and, pepper, salt and pepper shakers. I will probably only do the pepper shaker tonight. Um, you know, one's a carbon copy of the other. Um, next slide, please. You're going to see several pictures taken differently and, and in groups of, of what I'm going to present tonight. And this, this is um, this is my design, I guess, and I fiddle around with lengths and widths and, you know, I've, I've got the, the sizes here that I'll share with you that are going to be on the key if you want it, and we'll see that a little later on in the slides, but um, I figured that this has nice eye appeal for my old eyes. If somebody wants to make these and make them an inch taller, narrower, or whatever, um, if you do that, I would surely like for you to take a picture and send it to me. Um, you know, I'd appreciate that. Next slide. And again. I sell these in, in uh, different craft boutiques that I belong to. And it, I'm sorry, could you back up Ooh, just one slide, please? And, you know, I do the odd craft show also. The, um, the, uh, what's it called? I'm from Three Rivers, so I've been doing this for a couple of years. And this is a normal way of having a salt and pepper shaker. And some artist came along one time and said, why don't you lay them like this? And I did. And it has better eye appeal, but strange as it may seem, you know, people are funny. They'll come along and they'll pick up that one that's, that's leaning over and they'll stand it up. And, you know, this happens not once or twice. It, it'll happen, you know, maybe a dozen times during a, a craft weekend. Funny the way we are. Next slide, please. I'm not going to be turning as much as I'm going to be talking tonight. There's very little turning in, in what we see here. And, by the way, I wanted to mention, this is, is really a, an entry-level project. It's, it's a very, very simple project. And you're doing laminating and boring as much or more than you are turning. Here's a group... By the way, I usually, uh, I usually make these maybe 10 or a dozen at a time. Um, and we'll touch the, that a little bit later on. As far as the boring of the holes goes, it's a lot easier on a, on a drill press than it is on, on, a, on a lathe. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the bottom. We talked a, a, little, a little earlier about the bungs. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather have the bungs because I... You know, and I, I found out so that by not gluing them, if, they, if, if, the, um, if the caps move just a little bit, then you get a whole bunch of salt coming out. It's just, you know, it's not chic. Next slide, please. I don't know what that is or what that's supposed to denote. Another one. Um, a buddy of mine put this up on, on SketchUp. So if you, if you 
put the presentation on a key, you've got all the sizes here. Like I said, the sizes that I use. Feel free to monkey around with them a little bit. Next slide. <clears throat> There's no real trick. I, I, end, I start off with a block of wood that's going to be sanded at 2 by 2 and the, the final size is 4 and 3 quarters, but I like to start off with 5 inches long because you have to hold something in the, in the jaws. Um, the pieces of wood, the, you know, each one here is an eighth of an inch. So you make them out of maple. The, uh, what you're going to see is maple and, uh, and walnut. You know, you, wanna, you can use ash and mahogany, uh, whatever, whatever colors you like. So um, I'll usually take a, a piece off the outside, which is this one. A little bit more so you know it's nice to have this wood coming off this block of wood just to keep the harmony of the grain um, so I take a, 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 a strip an eighth of a piece well, I'm sorry an eighth of an inch thickness also with the mahogany and of course I take out another eighth of an inch to replace the uh, to, for, for the mahogany to, re, to, to, to replace it by mahogany uh, next slide please Glue choice. I use Type Bond 3. Um, I don't do an awful lot of laminating, you know, glue gets old and it doesn't work as well. So I'd rather pay an extra buck or two and, and get uh, Type Bond 3 and then I use it up quicker rather than having two or three types of, of glue. Um, next slide please. That's the glue up, nothing fancy. Next slide. Oh, sorry, can we back up? Um, I would suggest that, you know, you, 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 you glue up your pieces and you leave them in, uh, in the clamps overnight. Um, and I don't, I don't turn them for a week or two. Why? Um, I found that if I, if I glue them up tonight and I turn them tomorrow morning, there's still some humidity in the glue that's going to escape. And you'll feel that ridge in a couple of weeks, maybe. Even after everything is turned and sanded, there'll be a ridge where the, the, the two woods came together. And, you know, this, it's not quite as much fun. So I learned that if you, leave, if you glue something up and you're going to be turning it, and there's that chance of having a, an edge, you might want to wait for a couple of weeks for all the humidity to either to, to, to leave or to stabilize. And then once you turn and sand, then you should be good for for the length of the guarantee, I guess. Okay, what, uh, of course, what, what I'm doing is just, uh, you know, you guys know how to find the center of a block and punch the hole. And um, then we set it up in the, uh, in the lathe. So what I do is I put the, um, next slide please, I think it says that I put the top, I put the bottom in the headstock. What I'll usually do is, you know, what's the bottom and what's the top, I'll look at the wood and, and see, you know, what, what would look best up or down. Boy, you guys have some fancy... Fancy turning equipment here, I'm jealous. It's the first time that I've turned on a one-way, so if anything goes wrong, we'll blame it on the one-way. What I like to do is put the least amount of wood in the jaws that I can get away with. And you don't really need a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of wood because most of it is going to be held by the, uh, by the tail stock in any of it. Everything okay, Chloe? Uh, 
the first thing that I like to do is um, mark uh, the length that uh, I'm going to turn for the waist. And the waist is the waist. So what I normally do is I'll, I'll make uh, the waist about one and a half inches from the, uh, from the end. We're always measuring from the top, of course. Everybody can see okay? Yep. If there are any questions, please don't be shy. Everybody understood that? Is it everybody sleeping? Do you always keep your head towards the tail stop? <coughs> For turning. Um, and the reason is that, you know, I, I want to keep away from the jaws. And the first boring that I'm going to be doing is going to be through the top. So I start off this way just to, just to save time. So that's the waist, and then I measure four and three quarters from the top, and this is this this line is going to be what I'm going to be using, um, not tonight, of course, but the top the top has been sanded. That's something that I forgot to mention too. The top is is final sanded before it goes on on the lathe. I forgot to mention, um, after glue up, everything is sanded, and I sand, I sand the block to 220, and I sand the top to 220, because we're not going to touch this on the lathe. Um, and the, re the reason I say that you know, we sand it is because there are areas in here that, that won't be touched. This area and this area is going to be you know, wood as the block is, and I'm going to be removing some wood in here. So sand everything to 220, and I like rounding off the edges a little bit. Just, just sanding, you know. You could, I guess you could put it on a router or a shaper, but I just, you know, run it across my, my belt sander and, and get, just removing the edges, that's all. So now we have our marks. I'm re repeating myself, one and a half inch, and that's for the waist, and this is four and three quarters, and that's going to be chopped on the cutoff saw uh, after everything is done. Uh, what speed of wood would I, would I be turning at? I have, um, I turn on the Powermatic and, and we have a, a digital speed guide and I imagine I'd be about maybe eight or nine hundred but you know guys uh, a lot of people turn very very fast and if you follow the rules you'd probably be turning this maybe at 2,500, 3,000 if you follow the the guidelines and you know feet per minute or whatever I guess I don't turn all that fast I'm a bowl turner so I don't uh, I guess I don't turn all that fast and what I'm doing now is I'm just using a small um, a small um, party, party. party tool I'm losing my English I'm sorry uh, and, and what I'm doing is I'm just, you know, running a, a line in here. I don't want to go, I'm running the line just so that I just see the, um, the walnut. And this is just a guide for me to bring my, you know, my cutting into. Now, am I seeing the walnut? Not quite. You don't want to go too far. Um, now, using a tool of choice, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, slowly turn into this, into into the line. I like to, if it's at all possible, not not to get too far up in the corners. If you can leave maybe a quarter of an inch or so, I think it just looks a little bit better to have that that square corner. And uh, same, same on the bottom. You might even want to go up a little bit more, maybe a quarter, maybe three-eighths from the bottom. 
Um, I, uh, I'll use a skew. Skews work an awful lot better. There's a lot less sanding to do. Although I'm not a tremendous turner of skews. We'll see how this works. You want to try to keep your cut as straight as possible. Um, I've made a couple that that the line wasn't wasn't perfectly straight. It was you know bumped a little bit. It looks pretty shitty, really. Anybody that's, that's just starting, it's it's a nice little, it's a nice piece for somebody starting off. Uh, I wouldn't suggest people start off with a with a skew, but you know you can use spindle gouge, detail gouge, a bowl gouge, uh, you know, almost a roughing gouge. Now we'll see how we're coming. Ultimately, I like to have about a quarter of an inch of, of walnut showing. I think that's the nicest, you know, the nicest eye appeal. For my eyes, again. Maybe this is not as fast as I would like. I guess I'm spoiled with the um, the speed indicator. I I have a hard time working without it. I'm having lots of fun. I, I, I guess you people aren't enjoying it as much as I am. You made a good job, didn't you? Thank you. Go ahead. It's not going to be special. I just want to know if you prefer the oval skew compared to the standard square one. Um, I tell you, I'm, I, I don't use skews a lot. Uh, and to be quite frank, the only thing that I use skews with is this item here. I don't have enough experience with, with skews to say that, you know, I like one or the other best. Um, as a practice, the day before yesterday, I, I made one of these at home, and I used, uh, it wasn't a noble skew, I used uh, a square one. With, you know, with the edges ground off, of course, and this is a cheapo, I mean, the first set of tools that I, that I purchased, uh, it, it, this was part of a set, it's Benjamin's <coughs> Best. It's high speed steel, but it's, you know, it's not all that good. Um, one or the other. And, I, you know, to be quite frank, I'll, I'll just try using this one. It doesn't work real good the other day. Um, I, I, to answer your question, <laughs> I don't have a preference. 
And the reason I don't have a preference is I, I don't have enough experience with, uh, with SKUs. Just a question. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm sorry I couldn't provide you with a real good answer. I've got a question. Why don't you supply beer to the Turner? <laughs> That comes after, after the show. <laughs> if the show is good. <laughs> you guys are terrific. <clears throat> are you driving home tonight, or are you staying? I'm driving home because I haven't had a better offer. Uh, and, there, and there are no ladies in the room, so I probably won't have a better offer. Well, there is a lady in the Is she here? Yeah. Where is she? Ah, oh, there you are. <laughs> what do they call that? Showing up um, a, a, appropriately late? Fashionably. Fashionably late. Thank you. I'm losing my English. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather the oval skew than me. And I think it's because um, it's a little bit sharper. And um, I spoiled myself a month or two ago. I bought some uh, CBN wheels. And I got um, a CBN stone. Boy, these things, for skews, they're fantastic. You know, if you just want to touch them up quickly, to hone them quickly, they're fantastic. Apparently that, from what I learned after having spent money on a diamond wheel, that the diamond wheels aren't supposed to be made for high-speed steel, or they're not as good for high-speed steel as, as the CBNs are. Let's see how this works. <laughs> Yeah, I bought a diamond wheel from um, Andre uh, probably three years ago, and it was supposed to be my last wheel. It was 180. The grit was 180. And um, I would say it's probably about 600 now. I mean, there's just no more grit to it. And I, you know, I don't turn an awful lot. Now, uh, one of my buddies at ATVQ turns five times as much as I do. And he bought a diamond wheel from Andre before I did. And his wheel is still going strong and says it shows no sign of wear. Is it fate? Is there justice in this world? Maybe. Well, he's, has he not changed to uh, the CBN wheels now? Well, I think, I think he, he, he sells CBN wheels and I think he sells both. Yeah, but he's, I, I remember seeing him in uh, Hartford when he was trying to sell the, the diamond wheels. Everybody was telling them to start selling the CBN because yep. they last longer. Yep. They much yeah, and apparently the CBN wheels are made for HSS. And the diamond wheels were a number of years ago, but they've changed the theory or, or whatever. Well, apparently it gives a credit to the people. I, I don't want to advertise for anybody, but I bought my CBN wheels from, uh, from D Way. You know D Way? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've only had them a couple of months, but I'm, I'm real happy with them. Uh, maybe we'll speak again in three or four years' time, and uh, there won't be any more grit on them either. But no, if the things that I read say that the, the CBNs are going to be a lot better than the, the diamond. Let's wait and see. Did you get your slip stone from the way as well? Yeah, yeah. They're not cheap. I think the slip stone was 65 or 85. But you know, those D-Way wheels with exchange, with transport, with duty, with all that lovely stuff, they're 250 bucks a pop, you know. That's, that's a lot of money. Did you buy the one with the side? No. Nope. Nope. Uh, the, 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 the question was, did you buy the ones with the, the grits along the, along the side? And I, half inch down the side. Right. I have this half inch down the side, but it's not a radius wheel. The radius of the wheels, they're maybe, what, $20, $30 more? Um, but even the regular wheel, like I have, you can still sharpen on the side. It's just that if you're going to do a... Um, a skew, for example. Skew. Well, no. Well, 
Yeah, I, I, I present my skew to the wheel like this, but uh, some people want to do... Um, no hollow grind. If you don't want a hollow grind... Well, no. Well, no, no. if you put a wheel, if you do it this way, you're going to get a hollow grind. If you do it this way, you don't get a hollow grind. Ah, okay. I, I'd rather have a hollow grind. And the reason I'd rather have a... On a skew, the reason why I'd rather have a hollow grind is that yes. you can hone them up with this, you know, and lickety split. Um, no, uh, on, on, uh, on Dave's, um, we're getting off subject, uh, on Dave's um, videos, he shows, uh, I believe it's a, uh, it's a round nose scraper, and you can come off the wheel and, and go onto the side, is that what he was showing? Anyway, there's some, some reason for it, and I, I'm too cheap to, to pay the extra bucks for it. Now I am almost at the the, the the no turning point as far as the um, as the walnut goes. So I don't want to get any any I don't want to lose any more walnut at the point. And I'm not doing a very good job, but I usually touch this up with sanding. Um, I can I can go a little bit deeper, but not much. And what I like to do if you can see this, is I like to put a straight edge on here just to make sure that <coughs> that we don't have either a bump or a hollow. Now I don't know if you can, yeah you can probably see that okay. That's, uh, there's a little bit of a bump here. I might want to back up here a little bit more. <coughs> yeah that's, that's not bad. It's not bad. I'll, I'll try to get rid of some of these ridges here. Um, but you know, this is my way of doing it. <coughs> and you know, maybe if, if, if we set one of these up on a table that had a little bit of a bump in it, it might be okay too. the gentleman's question previously would be rather a <coughs> an oval skew or a regular one. I guess tonight I would rather not have either one. Probably a detail. I'd do a better job with a detail there. Then I might just pull that out. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up a little bit and take this um, this line down, maybe just a little bit. Yeah. Do you try to get the same distance of mahogany away from the view? Mm. Um, not really, because you know your angles are different. Okay. The angle here is different than than the angle here, so I don't really try to balance that too much because you know they're different because one's longer than the other, and and I think that's what kind of makes this attractive is the bottom from the waist down. You're always going to have more mahogany than from the waist up, because of the, the difference in angle. One last question. Yeah. Is the mahogany just to differentiate between the salt and the pepper? I'm sorry? I say, is the mahogany just to differentiate between the salt Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. The, the, yeah, the mahogany is for the pepper and the, the one with nothing is for the salt.
I don't really want to touch this waste any, anymore because we're going to be losing the uh, the mahogany. You know, I've I've made a couple of mistakes, and if you don't if you don't have if if you don't have the quarter inch of mahogany, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. Yeah, this is going to be one that's going to we're going to lose the mahogany. Design opportunity, absolutely right. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see. There's a, a, a just a, a touch of of maple showing. It's okay. What I usually do now is um, is, the is, the line, a, is the line on the long one straight? I'm sorry. Is the line on the long mahogany straight? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, but we'll fix it. There's a little bit of a bump right here. And normally I'd, I'd skew that out, but I know that I'm already deep enough here. So um, I think we'll, uh, we'll take it out with the, um, with the sander. And this is great for getting inside of bowls. It's fantastic. They told me about this, and they're on sale at $35, $39, whatever, so I bought one. Three-year guarantee. Um, it failed four or five months ago after a year and a half, and it gets some pretty tough usage. And they changed the model, and this is the model that they have now. Um, nice thing about it. It's electric. It, well, yes, it's electric, and there's a little Dell light here. And boy, when you're standing inside of a bowl, that Dell light comes in handy. Fantastic. Did Canadian Tire warn? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They apologized that they didn't have the same exact same model. I like the other one. Maybe it was a bit smaller for my small hands, but uh, this is fantastic. Nothing wrong with this. <laughs> If the turner knew anything about skews, we wouldn't have the sanding going on right now. But that's not the case. Um, <clears throat> when I'm using this, I always try to go in the up, have the sandpaper running in the opposite direction than the wood is running. So you're getting a double dose there. And it's, it's a lot easier to control. Start with 80, and I go to 220. Um, 80 is, is pretty rough, and I, I needed that pretty rough for this piece that I massacred. Um, like I said, the, uh, a couple of days ago, I, I made one uh, with a skew, and I didn't sand. It was fantastic. If you can not sand, it's that's the best recipe, because of course I I use I'm starting with 80, but I'm going to have to go down, and you know it's just time consuming. But um, it, it, it's well worth it because the uh, the bumps, the bumps and the rounds that we had are, are no longer there. Now, what I think I'll do 
is because I don't need as much. Uh, thank you for the water, by the way. I don't need as much um, as much energy as much sanding um, now that I've got you know now that I have these lines really really straight. I'll just um, I'll just go to the lighter grits <clears throat> by hand. What I normally do is, you know, 80, 120, 220, 320. Uh, we won't even go to 320 tonight. There was an article written some time ago in Wood Magazine. These people at Wood, they all, always do all kinds of fantastic tests. And um, where's the reverse, by the way? Just turn the switch. Here? No, no, no. no, no, no just no. the switch. In the front. At the the front. In the front. On the I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm the sorry. switch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they did. Um, they tested all kinds of sandpapers on different woods with different grits, and um, their findings were that if you use anything, be you know, from 80 to 120, 180, 220, that's all you need. If you use papers in between, you're wasting time and, and papers. So they, uh, that, it's nice that you know people do testing like this that help us, us guys out that don't really. You know, have the um, the wherewithal to be able to do this this testing. So really, what I'm doing is I'm just getting rid of the of the sanding marks from the previous grit. I love a lathe that has forward and reverse. Sanding time is cut so much when you can do you know when you can use both. How are we looking? Uh, another thing that I find is if I have a new piece of paper, they get pretty, uh, they're pretty, um, how can I say, they're pretty uh, stiff. And I just like to, you know, run them over uh, an edge both ways. Um, and it, it just makes them a little bit more soft. And maybe all these tricks or things that I'm saying, you guys have already discovered for yourself, but maybe there's one person in the crowd that didn't know, and um, so much the better. You want to keep the sandpaper moving when you're doing spindle work, because you'll get your... Um, you'll, get, uh, you'll get sanding lines. Um, if you want to be real particular, that's 220. That's about as far as we're going to go. What's nice to do is to just run the sandpaper quickly in the, um, in the grain direction. And if you had any sanding marks, they probably will disappear with this. How are we doing for time? Lots. Lots of time? Yep, we're okay. I'm going to have to start singing to fill in the time, guys. You're not going to want to hear that. Um, just because, just because, just because we want to be particular, we'll go to three points. I, um, in making my bowls, I used to sand to 600 until um, somebody made me realize that if you go to 600 here and you fit, and I, I use Levos like some of you fellows do, you're not getting, you're, you're so. You're, you're, too, you're sanded a little bit too much and you're glossing up your wood and you're not getting as, as much penetration as, um, as much finished penetration in the wood as if you stopped it, you know, a little, a little lower. Although between coats I, I, I use the 600. So I stop at 320 on my bowls and uh, sand between coats with 600. And Levos is a fantastic product. Glad it came along. You sand between coats of levos with what? 600. 600, eh? Okay. Dry. Some people I know sand wet, but no, I just I just do it dry by hand, of course. Very I, light. Very light. Yeah, oh yeah. And you know, it's just a very quick rub like this, you know, just to remove any any dust particles, any, you know, places where the wood is swelled a little bit. It's it's just it's not even a scuffing up, it's just a very polite And then you, you finish off with the levos after how many coats 
before you buff. Okay. I, normally I don't buff. I did buff the once a few years ago. Yeah. I use three coats of Levi's and that's it. Okay. Uh, if I'm, if I'm going to present something at a show somewhere, the last coat of Levi's I'll, I'll sand with four knot um, steel wool. Yeah. Um, and that really, I mean, that just removes any, anything. I, I was in um, uh, Lange Bay in Poiret, mm -hmm. and they had a piece that they had finished with Levi's, and uh, they did um, the first two coats, uh, you know, you put it on uh, very thinly, and then you wait 10 minutes, and then you wipe it all off. Uh, almost like buffing, and then the third coat they put it on with 2,000 grit sandpaper. They applied it with 2,000 grit sandpaper. They applied it with 2,000 grit sandpaper. Yes, while they were putting it on, and then they wiped everything off. And then they wiped it off. Okay. Yeah. That's something I might try. You know, because <clears throat> anybody that's worked with Levi's uh, even a little bit, I'd like to know how much of the third coat stays on okay. or comes off yeah, yeah. what percentage and it's got to be very very what stays on the woods it has to be very very minimal I, I guess at five percent but that's that's something I'm going to try um, working it in with 2,000 grit and then wiping it off they were saying uh, I, I was looking uh, at their website and they start off with uh, one tablespoon per square meter for the first coat or second coat and then the second or third coat it's one teaspoon square meter. Of course it depends on the wood, it depends yeah. on how much sanding you've done, it depends on a lot of things. That was the suggestion yeah. by Levos. And they also suggest 10 minutes uh, yeah, uh, before wiping off? 20 to 10, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, when, when I finish balls, I'll usually do 8, 10 at a time, finish 8, 10 at a time. Okay. And um, it certainly takes me longer than 10 minutes or 20 minutes. To get back to it, you know, before coming full cycle. Um, maybe after half three quarters of an hour, it'll probably start to get sticky, you know, to wipe it off. But when when you did the uh, beetle system, the mm -hmm. buckets, how mm -hmm. long did you wait uh, from the last coat of? Yeah, um, I was I was telling uh, we were speaking a little earlier, and and I said that I tried uh, buffing Levi's. But I read somewhere, or somebody told me, maybe I read somewhere that if you're going to, if you're going to buff it, you want to wait till it's fully cured. So I waited a month, and then uh, and then buffed it, and it came up like a piece of glass. It really did. I was, you know, it was a junk piece of oil, and uh, I was surprised um, at you know the luster. I was really surprised. Now I don't like that, and that this is this is you know my eyes. I don't like that sheen for the type of bowls that I do. Um, so I don't use it. I've got the system and maybe I should do one on occasion, you know, just to see what it looks like. And, you know, the people that I sell it to make get a kick out of, you know, make, might like it more or less. Than. The thing is, I guess the thing that worries me is that that luster probably, that, that sheen probably won't last years. And, you know, I, I'd hate for somebody to come back to me saying, you know, this was like a piece of glass when I bought it a year ago, and look at it now, it's, you know, it's, it's back to a satin type sheen. Some people put uh, epoxy on their walls. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of this uh, segmented work, they use, um, they use epoxy, and that just comes up fantastic. It's real beautiful. Like, uh, what is it, Chalk? Uh, what's his name? Yeah. Chalk. Uh, he's from the ATBQ also. Mm -hmm. Brother. Brother? No. Brother. Uh, Jacques Couture. Yeah. Jacques Couture, yeah. Jacques Couture. Yeah. Poor Jacques is, is not feeling well these days. No. Unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the thinness of the Levos finish still held up to the buffing, eh? Um, yeah. Because there's not a lot of... Uh, and, you know, I did it as an experiment. Yeah. Uh, I did half the bowl because the other half had cracked. Okay. Um, and I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really lean into it. No. Um, I was kind of polite with it. Okay. Um, and yes, that would worry me. 
we're not putting an awful, you know, there's not a lot of thickness there. I mean, there's some that has seeped into the wood, of course, but you don't want to go with the, um, with the, 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 the first operation. The triple A. With, yeah, with the grit. You know, I'd be, go very, very lightly with it. Especially if you had, you know, sanded 600, and you finished it off, and it's, you know, it's nice and, nice and, 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 and smooth. You don't want to, you know, I think you'll go through it fairly quickly. So you have to be gentle. Very, very gentle. Very, very gentle. I'm saying polite. That's, that's the French word. You want to be very gentle with it. Yep. Yep. So, we're turned, we're sanded. Um, you see a very, maybe a 32nd uh, of the maple showing through. I don't usually like that. Um, that's the way it is. It looks good. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, now we're going to... Um, just for you to see, I'm happy with that. Happy with that. Um, we're going to start uh, boring holes, and I'm I'm boring the holes here because the presentation was to do on a lathe, um, and when we're done the presentation, I'll speak to you about boring the holes. Uh, on a, on a drill press. Uh, something that I, I forgot to mention, and <clears throat> I, I, I probably don't have to mention it, although I've seen people uh, with presentations and they, they, uh, they dig uphill. And digging uphill for me is going down this way, and then let's go up this way. I've seen people do it, um, so I just want to, because people do it that have been turning longer than I have, I just think it's worth mentioning that, you know, you want to go downhill all the time. Respected turners, I've seen doing that. You have a little bit less respect for it. Uh, first thing is to put a uh, one and a quarter inch. By the way, lock the door. Somebody stole my caps. There's a slide at the end of the presentation that has a materials list, and you have all these. Everything that I've used is, is in the materials list, and the, the, the caps and the bungs come from craft supplies. Right. Uh, I've looked around, and I, I haven't seen them all other any anywhere else. They're they're good quality. They're stainless steel. They come. Packard wood has them. Packard has them. Same price. No. <coughs> More. They come, um, you know, they're, they're, they're machine punched, so they come with a protective coating. They're stainless steel, fantastic. Uh, forget what the price is, you'll see it in the last slide. Uh, they take an inch and a quarter hole, so we want to poke an inch and a quarter hole in here. And I'm not smarter than anybody else. But what I do is, I like to put a line. Can you see the line? If you can't, there's, there's a line with a felt pen right along here that tells me it's a quarter inch. So, you know, I go, I drill in up to the line and uh, that's it, that's reverse, that's forward, that's start. We'll back up the speed a little bit. Another little trick that I, you know, these are these are 
are inexpensive. I think they're a set from Canadian Tire. They're inexpensive fastener bits. And what I do every time, every time I use one. I'll touch it up very, very lightly with a, a, a diamond stone I got from Lee Valley. It's, it's a fine one. And you know, I'll just run it very quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll run along this, this face, both sides, and then very, very quickly, a little touch up on those edges. And they, they you know, the, the, the performance is greatly changed. They don't feed as much also. So now we are to the point, and you know, all these are on slides, so I'm going to be asking you to click, click through these, maybe a little bit later. Um, an inch and a quarter, one inch deep in the top. So now we're going to put a five-eighths in, and this is going to, um, we're going to go as far as we possibly can. just to make sure I'm not going up a bit, which I'm in the process of doing. <clears throat> and that's as far as I can go. Maybe I want to go a little bit further. Let's do that. Let's rather be safe than sorry. I'll go another half inch to make sure I have enough room on the other end. I keep looking for my key to operate this. So what we want to do now is reverse the shaker. Then I'm looking for my key. Now, I'm going to reverse it. This is sanded. This is finished, ready to go. So I don't want to put that in there and tighten it up and, you know, we're going to, we're going to see jaw marks. So. What I've done is, is I've made a little, um, little, little protectors, I guess you might want to call them. I'm putting a bumper in here because even though I have these little pieces of wood that are going to protect, they don't, the jaws don't hold as tight. So as soon as I, I start running the, um, the fastener bits through, they're just going to push the shaker to the bottom. So I, I put the, the spacer there for that reason. Chuck yeah. To put into your hole. That'd be perfect. You don't need everything a longer bit. I have uh, those uh, flat jaws. No, no, it's already done. From this end, Dave. I have those flat jaws that you attach wood to. Oh yeah, that'd be good too. Uh, yes, all these ideas are well and good. This is this for me is a temporary situation. You'll see when we're done. All the boring that if you're gonna do more than two more if you're gonna do two sets of these, you want to do it on a drill press. You know we're not doing a lot of monkey farting around this way, but I wanted to make the presentation, you know, on the lathe for people that that have a lathe and don't have a. You have to part off that last little bit of wood, though, don't you? Well, I don't part it off. I uh, I take it off with a um, chop saw.
what I've done is I've just taken, you know, little pieces of, of wood and I've put double sticky back tape on them. And the reason that I've got the sticky tape is just for them to hold on the jaws for a few seconds until I can get the, the, the shaker in there. You want to try putting small pieces, four small pieces of wood on four jaw uh, noses at the same time without any booze. Yeah, if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna do this all on a lathe, you have to come up with another solution other than this one. It's just takes too long. It takes too long, and it's you know it's no fun. It's like sanding. But you could have expanded the the chuck in into the yeah. the hole you just did. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't think the hole. Yeah, yeah, you could. You're absolutely right. Terrific idea. And any any scarring that you're having in there is going to be hidden by the cap. Fantastic. Great idea. Actually, we can do it now. No. The jaws don't close. Those ones close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Those but jaws are close enough. Those are the wide round. Huh? The other side. Uh, the other side. The other side. Yeah. You're reversing. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Wouldn't those jaws be able to fit in uh, the hole? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, an inch and a quarter hole. Yes, they would. They would expand into an inch and a quarter hole. No problem. You're absolutely right. You see, I learned something by being here tonight. What I'm doing now is I'm, I'm putting the. Uh, the point back in here just to be able to get it centered before I tighten things up in the jaw. In the chuck, I mean. You see what I mean by monkeying around? I mean, this is just wasted, wasted time and energy in my books if you can do it on a drill press. I have a sequence in one of the slides that, that talks about the best sequence to do this in uh, on the um, on the drill press. So an inch and a half hole in the bottom. This is for the bung hole, right? Yep. Now I think I made a mistake. I think the hole in the top. I think I made it an inch and a half. Which is going to be way too big for the for the uh, for the caps because this is an inch and a half and it's warm. Now an inch and a half goes a quarter inch deep. We've already got a quarter inch here that we're going to chop saw off later on, so you want to go a half an inch deep. And again, I've got lines on here. The first sets that I made were probably uh, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, craft supplies were selling the bungs, their red bungs. Yeah, like this. And I bought a bunch. Um, you have to use one inch hole for the red bungs, one and one sixteenth for the white bungs. And all they're selling these days, or the last two orders, maybe three orders I, that I put in, are the white bungs. So you want to go an inch and a sixteenth. And it's a bugger because an inch and one sixteenth you don't get in, in, um, in sets. 
you know, you have to buy the 1 and 1 sixteenths specially. Um, now I've got a problem. This is a Morris 2 taper. This is a Morris 3 taper. You can uh, take those apart, can't you, and just fit it right into that? If I can take it apart, anybody have a wrench? Fred, don't we have a sleeve for number two and number three? Uh, I think we probably do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we I don't want to put this, do I? Um, what I, what I'd like is that is is two wrenches so I can just yeah, 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 yeah. undo them. Okay, we got two wrenches somewhere. Yeah, these are really good. They're super expensive, eh? Yeah. 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 But boy, they really do a good job. You know, there's there are theories that if you're gonna buy a tool, buy a good one, then you won't have to buy another one to replace it. And um, if you buy that one, you won't have any money to buy another. One. You know, these, these are Canadian Tire fastener bits, and you probably get a set on sale for 50 bucks maybe. And there may be hmm, a dozen or 15. Um, if I had it to do over again, I, you know, you don't need all those sizes. You don't need a dozen or 15 uh, fastener bits. Fantastic. Um, we're going to have fun getting it out, but besides that, we'll be okay. Remover. I don't know if we have that little pin to knock it out there. The wedge? Yeah. I don't think we have one here. I don't have one. Anyway, we'll get it out. It's in now, so we'll, we'll have to get it out. These, I, I forget the name of it. Do you remember the name Maxi of these? Cut. Maxi Cuts from Lee Valley. They're oh, Bob, friggin' Bob, expensive. Bob bought some there. But boy, I'm telling you, if you're making pepper mills, if you're doing stuff like that, these things, they don't wander. They cut like razor blades. I've not sharpened them. I told you that I, I give a little, you know, a quick sharpen on these cheap fastener bits. I haven't dared touch this one because I don't want to monkey with it. And I've, you know, drilled a few holes. And um, boy, if I had it to do over again, I would have taken the 50 bucks and bought one and a half of these things and added that to the to the group. So one and one sixteenth, and I've got to go in three eighths. Oh, very good, good. I'd rather go a little too deep than not deep, deep enough, and this is just to, to be able to set the bone. Uh, yeah, now we have to get this out. And put the Jacob's cut chuck back in and... I ran off. You know, a little earlier I made a joke, I said, this is a fantastic... This is a real nice piece of equipment. And I said, if you can't find it tomorrow morning, it'll probably be in my plastic box. So he, he took me seriously. Which maybe you should. Is that yours or the Pups? That's Pups. mine now. Where's it here? It's mine now. No, no, it's mine. It belongs to you personally? Yeah. Personally, yes. I bought it from Rohit. Okay. Oh, you're paying too much for it. <laughs> so now we're back to the cheap old Foster bits. There we go. So really, that's it. Um, what what size hole are you drilling? Uh, for the salt? Uh, the inside yeah. is 5 eighths. 5 eighths. Now, I picked that. Um, you could make them larger. You could make them larger. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind that your waste oh. is, is, going to, is going to be there. Yeah. Um, and that's probably about an inch and a half, uh, I would think. So you have a 5 eighths. There's plenty of room to go a little bit more. You could go an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter. Oh, not that well. You see, the waist, the waist is um, an inch and three eighths. So you can go an inch easy. Keep in mind, you know, the cheaper bits they wander a bit. But yeah, you could go a lot bigger than five eighths. But uh, that's what I choose to go to be on the safe side. So he doesn't use that much pepper, so that's. Uh... <laughs> uh, can we get back to the slides, please, and see where we are? 
see what I've missed. <coughs> you finished with a particular finish? Levas. The first ones I did, I, I, I didn't know of Levas at the time, and I was using um, uh, Mike Mahoney's walnut oil, uh, which is, you know, non-permanent, of course. Um, and I was using um, a polyurethane finish. Um, off, off the lathe, you know, brushed on. Um, Do you put the levos on, uh, on the lathe? No, right? No. No, I don't do... Um, and, you know, I haven't got a real good reason to justify why I don't, but the only thing that I will finish on, on the lathe is um, uh, wine bottle stoppers. Because they're there, I put the one coat on and, and that's it. The Levas, um, I suppose because it has to be done in two stages, you know, you, can only, you can't finish 100% of the bowl with, you know, on a lathe. You've always got the damn foot. Yeah. Um, so I just, Might as well do it I, I, I just do it off the lathe. And, yeah. and like I say, I save up 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bowls and I finish them all in, in one crack. How many bowls do you do a year? Ooh. That's a good question. Uh, probably, I don't know, more than 50. Do you sell that many too? Um, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot that I give away. Yeah, I wish I did sell 50. I wish I did sell 50. And I, you know, the reason that I don't sell 50 is because I'm too lazy to go out and peddle them. Um, I, I don't get a real kick out of going around all these shows and carting my stuff around and, you know, setting up, selling during the daytime, taking everything down at night, setting up the next morning, you know, maybe if I was younger. Marketing is a terrible thing. It's a bitch. Marketing, yeah, you're right. I take my hat off to any marketing people. And I, the, the, where, where I sell most of my stuff are in craft stores, and they're groups that have gotten together, and, and we don't pay any salaries, but each person has to, has to be uh, at the store a day a month. Which is okay. Yeah, you get a good percentage back, um, but um, you know, even now as time goes on, I'm 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 shying away from that. I've I've left one of these places, and I'm I still only have one left. But I've got my bowls in a few museums, and you know, they take more money. But you don't, you know, all you do is is deliver them and wait for the check to come in. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, where are we on the slides? My friends, oh, okay, you can click away till the cows go home. I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> I guess the, the, the turner didn't tell you to keep clicking. You see, like I said, my slides are, are set up so that if you go with this, you go home with the, the PDF portion of this, you'll have everything that you need, really, to, to do it. Okay, one more time. And again, and again. There we are. Now, um, I, take the, um, I take the pepper shaker out of the, uh, out of the lathe and uh, cut at the lines with the cutoffs up. And the next slide shows, talks about what? Okay, it talks about, uh, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to turn the, uh, the salt shaker tonight. What you want to do when you're making the salt shaker, you want to make sure that, the, you know, we, I went in at an inch and a half with my um, thin parting tool. And just for the hell of it, I'm sure I'm not at an inch and a half now. Uh, it's maybe an inch and, yeah, it's an inch and three-eighths. So what you want to do is when you make the salt shaker, as you're turning it, you want to make sure that you're an inch and three-eighths. You don't want, you know, the salt shaker to be a little bit, a little bit higher. You don't want the weight to be a little bit higher. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so that's the only thing I had to say about the salt shakers. You want to make, sh make sure that they're made exactly the same as the pepper so that they balance nicely when there's one next to each other. Next slide. Quick question. Yeah. Did you use the golden mean as a design? Um, that's a that's a hell of a good question. Um, when I when I started off, 
you know, I had, I had in mind what I wanted to make, and I made a real bloody big shaker. It must have been, I don't know, three and a half inches square. Way, way, way too big. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I made it smaller, maybe, you know, in the two-inch area, which this is. Although if you make them an inch and a half, it's okay, too. Um, then I, I went with the golden rule. And I wasn't happy with, I wasn't happy with, with the waist. Um, the waist was, was down here somewhere, a little bit lower um, than this one is. Now, if I showed that one that I made following the golden rule to you, you might say, boy, that's fantastic. Um, and the only person I have to please is myself, so I find it better a little bit higher up than the golden rule. It's not a half an inch higher up. It's, it's, a little, it's close to the golden rule, but it's not bang on. Good question. Excellent question. I wouldn't have thought of asking it. Um, yeah, this slide says you want, you want to make sure that you, you size them both the same. The next slide we're talking about the, um, the cap that I glue in and you know I made this hole too big so we're going to lose the cap. So this is going to be fancy firewood. Put an insert, and then you'll have a round ring around the cap. Would you like to do that? <laughs> <laughs> the suggestion was put in an insert. Yep, you can do that. And you know, I'm, I might do that. Walnut insert. Well, you need two. Walnut insert. You, have to, you would have to screw up on the other one. Well, I don't think you see, you're not going to see the insert. I don't know if we can see this. An insert would work. Yeah. It really would because, you know... You could make it a different kind of wood. Yeah, make it bright, make it the same color as the, 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 walnut, the walnut. Or make a bigger hole. Yeah, make, make, it, make it walnut. Yeah, Make it walnut. And then they'd see the... There's not a, a lot of shimmy room in there. No. No. But, you know, you're right. If it, yes, if I put a, an insert in... Make it a bigger hole? Then, yeah. It's going to be difficult open. making a bigger hole. Design opportunity. Yeah, design opportunity. I think what I do is, is I, I go with making the same mistake on the salt shaker, put an insert in both of them, and uh, away we go. And sell them for twice as much. <laughs> By the way, while I think of it, um, because you're probably too shy to ask this, the, the question, I sell a pair for 50 bucks. And I'll make at least, at least a dozen a year. So I mean, I get rid of let's say one a month, and and I don't think that's a lot of money. Oh, another question. Um, the last time I made them, I timed myself. I made nine. It took me 18 hours, and this is wood glue up till you know matching them together with an elastic band or a little a little ribbon. So it's it's two hours uh, two hours a pair. I'm not a fast turner. Um, some of you fellows would certainly be able to cut down on, on the time. Or not. Um, I think you probably could without getting up too early in the morning. The next slide is going to be is going to show the uh, the uh, the cap and, and like I said earlier, um, I crazy glue them in place um, just so that you don't have slackness, you're not losing salt all over the, the damn place, it's, it, you know, if, if they were mine and if they were going to friends, well, maybe not, but, you know, I'm selling them, so I don't, I don't want shit to happen. You don't want them to come back to you. I'd rather not. Okay, the next slide is the jig that I made for the drill press, and boy, it's not much of a jig. It's really not much of a jig. And all it does is it holds the, the shakers in place. This piece of wood goes down and is screwed in, you know, beyond this piece of wood. This piece of wood is sitting on this one, and the screws come in from the bottom. And of course, they're screwed in here also. Now, what, what this is doing is it's just giving it more, more mechanical strength so that, you know, it's not, it's not moving around. Um, and the next slide is going to, and I won't go through all of this, it just gives the sequence. And this is the most efficient sequence that I can find. 
And what you're doing is because you know you've got ten sets, you've got twenty shakers that you want to you want to bore. Um, this is the quickest way to do it. Uh, you have to keep in mind that you know sometimes they're top up, sometimes they're top down. Just keep that in mind because mistakes happen. We've proven it here tonight. Yes, there's a question. I'm curious. Uh, had you considered putting little pieces of wood inside to be able to just insert the, uh, the shaker and it would hold it in place? Or it, only seems to be, it only seems to be supported on two sides. Yes, it's supported on two sides um, with my hand on the other side. Ah, okay. okay. The picture, you don't see that, but my, my hand normally would be here. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I guess I would my hand wasn't there because it was holding the camera. <laughs> Um, I would I would have put like two small pieces of wood or dowels just to then you have to be the whole then you can only make one size though. Now okay this this is great. The the dowels that you're talking about would go here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I buy that. And, and you know what you're doing with with a ninety degree angle on the piece of on the piece of wood is you're just stopping it from turning because there's, there's quite a bit of shear strength there, um, shear force. So yeah, if you put those two dowels in there, you're just, you're just helping things out. Uh, that's a good idea. Now, when, when I start making these, usually I'll take a piece of, of lumber and ideally it's two inches by two inches. It may be one and three quarters, maybe two and an eighth. And your, your dowels might not, you know, yeah. work out perfectly, but you can put a little piece of shimmer wood. I mean, you can you can do that. And the dowels are a hell of a good idea. The only thing I would say with the dowels is that you know you have a finished piece of wood here. If it starts skewing around too much, you're going to be bruising the sides here. But I, I'm you know I'm sure you can do something to to, to, to to alleviate that. If you can't hold it, a couple of quick clamps or rubber face clamps will do that too. Yeah, it's just that you know you're clamping. You, you got twenty to do. The more clamping, the more time, you know. It's quick clamps, you know? Oh, okay. How many have you made using that system? Oh, um, I would say... Yeah. 30? 30 sets? 60... That seems, that seems to work pretty well. 60 sh oh, yeah, yeah, 60 shakers. That's and I tell you, you know, if, if, I, had the, if I had these... What's it called in a man? Maxi cut. If I had, if all of my fossils were maxi cuts, you don't need anywhere near the strength to hold them in place. I mean, these are fantastic. When you have, when you have a whole series of them, are you selective? Like you try to match them? Or? Oh, they're matched. They're matched. They're matched when they come off the, off the, um, off the, uh, I want to say loom. Yeah, when they come off the lathe, they're matched. Now, and they're, they're matched more... I'm just wondering how you, how, how you match them. If, okay. If the cuts are not uh, air, you know... I make sure that the salt shaker is exactly the same as the pepper shaker. Okay? Um, like I said, I'm using often odd scraps of lumber. Um, all the measurements that you see here are ideal. I may start with a block that's, you know, five and, uh, I don't know, five and three-eighths. So then the waist is going to be just a titch higher. But they'll be matched as far as height and weight and, and waist goes. And you're going to say, yeah, but you could cut them all, all the same size. Yes, but sometimes when I, when I glue this up, my piece of walnut may be, you know, a little bit short. So, I mean, I know that one's going to be... A little bit short, so the salt shaker has to be a bit short. That's why I say they're matched up as soon as they come off the, the lathe. And they stay together as a pair through the boring stages. And, and you know, also at, uh, when I finish them, I, I keep the, the, the pair together so that, you know, I don't have to... Where the hell did this one go, you know? That's the way I do it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. It's not really to you. The pen turners. Do they have a jig? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. One. They do. A jig for boring. For boring, yeah. 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 Sure. Actually, that's, uh, it really could possibly work for that, too. The, the pen, the, the pen box. Yeah. You know, the one that the jig. No, they have, like, two little V's, <coughs> 90 degree V's. Ah, yeah. 
and uh, they go out they and they come out. So that, that would mark. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, would that mark? Because you're, you know, you're boring holes in a, uh, yeah, in a finished product, and uh, you know, yeah. shit, you don't want to go sanding afterwards. Yeah. I mean, you can, but yeah. if you've made a dozen sets, you've got 24 that you got to sand a little bit. And there's always that last little bit that's a bitch to get off, and then you say, ah, sh the you know, off to the next one. And then once it's finished, I should have spent another 18 seconds and sanded that, you know. Well, uh, using that drill press makes it a less boring job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. You know. Oh, come on. You didn't get that joke. Did you hear that joke here? No. <laughs> Tell him again, Fred. He using says the drill press <laughs> would be less boring. <laughs> less boring. <laughs> boring. Yeah. Okay. Makes it less boring. Boy, I, I hope I haven't been as boring as your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next, the next slide is, is just a sequence for boring on the, on the uh, drill press. Okay, now we're back. We're off to the materials list. This is the materials list. Uh, we're talking about tight bond glue. I'm talking about getting it from Lee Valley. The salt shaker caps, one and three stainless, I've got the, the item number in there, and the rubber bungs, um, and they're from um, Craft Supplies, woodturnerscatalog.com. Uh, I've got the prices there, uh, that's two seventy and two ten. You're talking five dollars worth of, um, of hardware per, per pair. Plus the Levos. Plus the Levos. And we know that isn't cheap. And you know, you only use a teaspoon. <laughs> How come I use uh, four or five cans a year? Uh, you know, I think the cans are what the big, the 750 milliliters are about sixty dollars, right, plus tax. And you know, I told the fellow that I buy this from in in in, in Tuatabiaga. I went to him and I said, you know, this is way too expensive, way way too expensive. But if you doubled your price, I'd still buy it. <laughs> don't tell them. Really? That was a mistake. Don't tell them. Maybe, but I I think so highly of this lever. I mean, it's a dream come true to to, to bowl for a, a permanent finish on a bowl. Edible. Edible. Yes. Yes. Although my theory is that any finish you put on a bowl, once it's dry, once it's dry, once the curing, once the COVs have have evaporated, you know, I don't think. I, will, I wouldn't mind eating out of anything, any kind of a varnish, any kind of a solvent in the varnish. In the varnish. After a month, boy, other stuff is going to kill us an, an awful lot quicker than that. Hey, I'm at the question stage. Do you have any questions? Yes? Just one quick one. I, I don't want to insult you, but I assume this is your design? Yes. Um, something I meant to say at the beginning of the... Um, of the demo is uh, is is I thank Claude very much. He's uh, he sent me an email and asked if, if I'd uh, if I'd be interested in, in doing a demo. And I'm a bowl turner, so I said, "Geez, you guys have all seen bowl turners coming out of your Yahoo. You don't need a bowl turner." So I don't really have any niche. I don't really have anything that you know I do in particular that I think would interest your club. And he wrote back and he saw two items on my website. One was the salt and pepper shaker, and one was or something else I don't even want to talk about. Um, he said, geez, the salt and pepper shaker look interesting. Would you consider demoing that? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I, guess I could. Um, because it's my design, and I am certainly not. My two sons are creative as I'll get out. Um, they, they put the presentation together, by the way. Um, and they, um, so this is my design, and this is really about the only thing that I've designed, other than you know, maybe the forms of my bowls are a little bit more precise, a little have more pleasing curves than they did X number of years ago. But yeah, this is my design, and um, it's really the only thing that I have designed that you know I can be a little bit proud of, and I, I think it has a, an appealing, you know, uh, pleasant to the eye uh, as far as that goes. Uh, any other questions? Come on, we're yeah. When you do the glue up on the clamps, yep. uh, do, you, do you get any uh, slippery? Slip? Yep, yep, sure do. That's it. Prevent it. Thank you for asking the question. The question was when you do the glue up, do you get any wood movement? Yep, I do. Um, and you know, you try to get it as straight as you can. And usually what I do is I'll, I'll 
tip them on, on the side and push it down on the bench and then put the clamps on it. And hopefully they won't move too much. But there's a little bit of room there that if there is wood movement, I, I square them up on, the, uh, on my belt sander. Good question. And this is the other reason why I, I pair them up. I'll get the same size salt and pepper shakers, you know, because I've, I've lost maybe a sixteenth on the sander uh, on one and not on the other. So I'll measure them up and that's the, they, they, they get matched there also before I start turning. Yep? Uh, if you're doing a whole swivel of it, mm -hmm. uh, if you glue up a long piece. Yes, that's what uh, I do. Then you can square it up on the jointer, rest it through the thickness planer, yep. and then chop it up <coughs> on your chop saw for the little. And it stays just yeah, that's what I do. Is you know, I, I, I use small pieces to use them up, and I'll never, I'll never, I did for the, for the picture there, but I never do, a glue up of one. You know, I'll do a glue up of five or six or whatever, length of bore that I have. And yes, and everything is kept a little bit straighter. Just you know, everything is just a little bit tighter that way too. You don't get as much of this wandering. Yeah. Any more questions? The next slide has my, um, my address, um, where, and my phone number, my website, um, and my email address. And the reason I put that there is if any of you take this information uh, away from here on a key, and you make one or two or a bunch, and you do different sizes, it'd be great to get some feedback from you saying, boy, I did this, and you know, what do you think of this one? Um, I'm not saying that you know this can't be improved and maybe because of the ones that you do I may make them six and a half inches high at some point in time. I don't know, you know, whatever whatever you guys come back to me with feedback, I mean uh, I'm open to it. On the top. <laughs> <laughs> a design opportunity. There's Any no more questions? No yeah. with the salt in the, in the wood? Pardon me? There's no reaction with the salt in the wood? I haven't had any. Um, the first one I made was Christmas present for 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 friends probably probably f at least five years ago, at the very least five years ago. Ours are you know sit on the stove and there's a lot of grease and, and whatever. Well, not a lot, but you know that's the place in the house that has most grease is you know right under the right under the, the evacuation hood. Um, but of course they they they're a poly finish that they put on back then, and I haven't. I haven't had any complaints with the with the Levos, and I don't think I will. For that. Any other questions? Well, now's the time for my closing joke. Oh, I'm afraid so. That was a joke. <laughs> your standards, your standards are pretty low, guys. <laughs> you know. You always laugh at the president's jokes. We're forced to. The last, the He's the yeah. If if I offend anybody with this joke, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. And I'm saying this mainly because there's a lady with us, and it's not really a a joke for for ladies. Maybe it is, depending I, on the lady, I, I guess. An announcement: I spent a quarter of a century with 17 year olds. I know stuff you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. I have three children. So I spent three years with 17-year-olds, and that's it. Um, a few years ago, back in the days of the miniskirts, there was, uh, the gods were up in the heavens, and they were, you know, looking down upon earth, and they were saying, you know, what they saw of good of what was happening on, their, on earth and, what, and the bad things that were happening on earth. And one of the gods, his name was Thor, and that's the Greek god for thunder. He was, somebody has heard this joke. So he's sitting up in the heavens with his, with his buddy, uh, with his other, um, other friends, and he, he looked down on earth, and he said, geez, look at those girls in the miniskirts. And you know, he just couldn't get over the, 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 the sight of them. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a, a human form, a human male form, a young guy, and I'm going to go down to earth, and I'm going to see, you know, what these girls know, what they can do, uh, just, you know, treat myself. So he takes the form of a very handsome young fellow in his 20s, and he goes down to earth and he, you know, 
took the mannerisms and everything of a, of a young fellow, and he went to a bar because that's where things seem to happen. So he wasn't in this bar very long when uh, a gal came up to him and he started talking and whatnot. And um, they ended up at her place. And, uh, of course, one thing led to another, and they made love that night. Not once, not twice, maybe a dozen times. So he wakes up in the morning, and the girl's not, not in bed with him anymore. So he, you know, starts wondering and thinking, geez, you know, maybe I took advantage of this poor girl, and maybe I should, you know, tell her where I'm from and whatnot, not to, not to lead her on. So um, he gets up and he starts scurrying around the apartment, and he sees her in the bathtub, uh, sorry, in the bathroom, sitting on the toilet. And then, you know, the door was cracked open. So he opens the door, and he said, I'm going to come, you know, I don't say it. So he said, I'm Thor. And she said, you're Thor? I'm so Thor, I can hardly piff. <laughs> That's it, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>